Well, hey everybody, I'm Brittany. Welcome to Friendship Online. Thank you for spending part of the Lord's Day with us, especially if it's your first time listening in. Before we get started today, we wanted to give you a look at some things happening at Friendship. Our mission never stops. We want the love that God shows us to spill beyond the walls of our building. And right now that continues to happen through your giving. We are truly thankful for those who are consistent, sacrificial givers to this ministry. And because of your generosity, we continue to give 10% of everything that comes into Friendship back out to our community and region. If you would like to support the mission of the church, you can give online at friendshipbc.com give. No matter your background or current situation, just know that this is the place for you and we are so glad to have you here. We also want you to know that there is a place at Friendship that's perfect for you. If you're ready to get started, the best way to do that is to go to friendshipbc.com connect, take a second to fill a little bit of information about you, and later this week, one of our pastors will connect with you. Well, thanks so much for being with us today. We believe you are listening for a reason. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are at. And our hope is that you leave this time encouraged and closer to him than ever before. Let us know if we can help you in any way by commenting on the live stream and be sure to connect with us at friendshipbc.com and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at Friendship. We hope you have a great weekend. Good morning, Friendship. I hope this service is finding you well. I'm glad you are joining us. I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28, and I'd love for you to read along with me. I'm reading from the ESV. After that, um, I'll pray, and then we're going to move into our regular time of worshiping through song, and then hear the word proclaimed by Pastor Todd. So um, join with me now as I read from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but wherever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in, glory of his fa- in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you in Christ's name. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you for the word that you have set before us. Help us to follow you well. God, as we worship you, may you be pleased with our song. May you be pleased with the way we respond to this message. I ask that you be with Pastor Todd as he preaches this word. Help our hearts to be changed and different. And may may, may we as one church glorify you. In Christ's name, amen. When the ground beneath my feet gives way I hear the sound of crashing waves All my world is washing out to sea I'm hidden safe in the God Who never moves Holding fast to the promise of the truth You are holding tighter still to me The rock won't move and His word is strong The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock won't move and his word is strong. The rock won't move and his love can't be undone. The rock of our salvation. 
hope is in the promise of your blood. My support within the raging flood, even in the tempest, I can sing. I'm hidden safe in the God who never moves, holding fast to the promise of your truth. You are holding. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone a sigh still and all alone on 
the third at break of dawn son of heaven rose again who oh, trampled death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King oh praise the name of the Lord resurrection, God, we would have no hope. We praise you tonight, Lord. Good morning, church, and good morning to all of you who are visiting our live stream this morning. Today we are in week two of a three-week series titled, The Church Has Left the Building. Last week we considered our message, today we consider our mission. And to do so, we're going to consider the great command and the great commission found in the book of Matthew. We take our mission straight from the Word of God in two places. So, open up to the book of Matthew, put a uh, bookmark in chapter 22, and one in chapter 28. We're going to consider the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. But let's start by praying together. Our great God, we are so desperate for Your Word. We are desperate for Your peace. We are desperate for what You Give to us through your Holy Spirit the connection that we have to you and to one another. And so this morning, Lord, although we are distant from each other, we pray that through the bond of your Holy Spirit, we be drawn as one spirit together to worship you, to learn from you, and to be pushed forward by you in our lives. Lord, may you bless our time, may you bless your word, and may, may you bless those that are listening. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so two places in the book of Matthew. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. I'm going to be starting in Matthew chapter 22, looking at verses 36 through 40. This is what it says. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now flip over to Matthew chapter 28. 
in Matthew chapter 28. We're going to pick up in verse 16. This is what it says. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is God's Word to us. So to understand our mission, there's a very important distinction we must first consider or set the stage, if you will. And I want to do that through the use of three words. Those three words are message, mission, and method. Our message, as we considered last time, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That never changes. Our mission, to be as plain as I can in this, is twofold. Our mission as a church is to glorify God and make disciples. We are to glorify God and make disciples. And we accomplish this mission by bringing our message to bear on the lives of men and women. How we bring that message to bear is called our method. Method is really just the current approach to the mission. For example, we're meeting in the parking lot on Sunday mornings. We're also meeting via live stream uh, as you're watching right now. That is our current method. Our message is the same, our mission is the same, but our method has adapted to 2020. Why is this distinction so important? Because we can easily confuse the method with the mission. Let me explain it this way. If you're from Gen X, you know, the best generation, I'm certain that the majority of your book reports from grammar school came word for word, like mine did, from the Encyclopedia Britannica. But since 2010, the, Encyclo the Encyclopedia Britannica has gone the way of the mimeograph machine. If you don't know what that is, ask your parents. And some of you likely remember film-based cameras. 1984, I was nine years old. My mom gave me a Kodak disc. I was going to be the next Ansel Adams until I broke it. And it didn't really take good pictures anyway. Kodak, like Britannica, failed back in, I think Kodak was 2012. They declared bankruptcy after Kodak had dominated the film-based photography world for over 100 years. I think like 120 years. Why did they fail? Forbes actually did a really good article on them several years ago. And in the article it said, Kodak refused to respond to the massive changes in culture which had become dominated by digital photography. Kodak bet its future on its past and of course lost the bet. And so we see these massive organizations are just fading away. And the sad part is the local church is not exempt from this. American evangelicalism is struggling, I, I believe, for at least one clear reason. Many have confused the method with the mission. Kodak's mission was photography, but their method was film-based photography. And they were adamant about not joining the digital photography craze. Now they're gone. And very few people use actual film anymore. There are certainly exceptions, but it's more novelty than anything else. Britannica's mission was knowledge, and their method was books. But like Kodak, they made their method, their mission, and like Kodak, they're gone. We have a message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a mission to glorify God and make disciples. In times like these, when we really don't know what the future holds, we must never forget our message or our mission. We will have more times like this. And we will hold fast to the message. And we will hold fast to the mission. The methods come and go. But Jesus, His Gospel, our work in the Gospel is forever. And so today, I want us to clearly understand our mission. And I want to do so by bookending it with our message and our mission. So we'll do this under three headings. First, I want us to understand our method. And I'm calling this first headed uh, heading, Methods 
always change. No amount of cultural shift will change the gospel. Our message will never change. The mission to glorify God and make disciples also doesn't change. That's always the mission of the church. That's our mission, and it's the mission of the local church in Namibia, in Bangalore, and in Boston. Their mission statement might be worded a little bit differently, but in the end, if you boil it down, it comes down to those two things. Glorify God, make disciples. That's that's the mission of the local church. This local church, Friendship Baptist Church, was founded in 1982. The message in 2020 is exactly the same as it was in 1982. The mission in 2020 is exactly the same as it was in 1982. The method has certainly changed since 1982. And I think there are several who are still part of our church who were around in the very early days. And you can testify to the fact that the method has changed, and it's changed frequently. Here's the challenge. Far too many churches have mixed up the method with the mission. And sometimes we get nostalgia. And the nostalgia for the old days of the church is really about the method. I remember when this church did X. The challenge is, as sweet as those times may have been, X probably wouldn't work in the cultural context that we find ourselves in today as it did in previous generations. A method is just a current approach that helps you accomplish your mission, and our methods always change. Take, for instance, life groups. I love my life group, even if they only kind of tolerate me. I love our conversations. I love how we can minister to each other. Even, I mean, even during the summer when we're not technically meeting, I, I think the people in my life group are the people that I most often interact with outside of the guys on the elder team. If you're not in a life group, please, please consider joining one this fall. You, you, you won't regret it. Regret it. I, and that's a guarantee. Money back guarantee. All the money you spend on life group, I'll give it all back to you if if it isn't beneficial in your life. Life groups are really where community really happens here. It's where you can be in close fellowship with others. Uh, You can go to our reopening page, friendshipbc.com slash reopening. You can see who's meeting and when. Better still, if you want to host a life group, That would be even better. Let me know. We can sit down and talk through it. I'd like to start at least two more in-person life groups this fall. I'd also love to see us have two virtual life groups that meet as well for those who aren't comfortable joining together. So if you have interest in leading those, let me know. But again, life groups are a method, aren't they? They're not the mission. But right now, I think it's the most healthy way for you to be discipled and to experience pastoral care as our church continues to grow, and by all indications it will, if we're serious about our message and our mission, the more we will learn that pastoral care actually happens primarily in our small groups. This is is because all of our small groups have at least one elder that participates in them, and the elders in those groups are discipling others to give that pastoral care to their brothers and sisters in Christ. Sunday mornings are excellent. If you're a live streamer, please know I'm very thankful for you. And and, and if this is your new normal for a season, and you're like, I'm just not ready to be with others, I want to watch from home, you have my full support. But even if you come here and join outside worship, it's challenging to have deep, meaningful connection with people. And that was true even pre-COVID. Only because in a five-minute conversation when you're hustling around, Uh, getting your kids or doing other things, and uh, it's just a little hello. I mean, it's good to be sure. I mean, to be with Christians, to worship, to be in each other's company, that is priceless. It's biblical. Life groups, man, that's you're in someone's house. I mean, you're eating their snacks, and you're having deep conversations for a few hours. I don't know if you can tell, but I love life groups, and I'm sold out in the importance of life groups. But here's the thing, I understand life groups are a method. They are a method to accomplish our mission. They are not our message or our mission, they're a method. 
I'm really fond of how they work right now, but if in five or ten years they don't work like they are supposed to do for whatever reason, we reconsider that method. Life groups are good, but they're not sacred. If you were in the Christian church in the 90s or the 2000s, you probably, everyone was talking about the worship wars, which still kind of cracks me up. I'm a veteran of the worship wars of the 90s and the 2000s. What was happening? Well, many churches were moving from hymnody to modern worship songs. And it split churches and it divided friends. I'm not going to that church unless they have a book. I'm not looking at words on the wall. I need the book. I need the hymnal. And it was ugly in some places. But again, we're talking method. There are many great hymns. I love the old hymns. But there's some real duds, even in the Baptist hymnal. The same is true with modern worship. But either way, song style is a method that will change with culture and generations. I mean, what if someone at Kodak had asked, are we in the film business or the photography business? If they answered we're in the photography business, then the steady decline of film use would have had less and less impact on their bottom line. Instead, Facebook, a social media platform that we're using right now, they decided they want to be in the photography business and they bought Instagram. And now, the leader in all of photography business has to be a computer company called Apple. Apple, I believe, is the leader in all photography because every iteration of the iPhone, the camera just keeps getting better and better and better. How many of you in your family always say, hey, make sure you bring dad's phone because that has the best camera on it? And so now I would guess the majority of pictures taken in 2020 are done with a phone, not a camera, and certainly not with film. Kodak mistook their method with their mission. So, church, what about us? What business are we in? Are we in the have-to worship services with modern worship indoors with Sunday school in between business? Or are we in the glorify God and make disciples business? 2020 has actually answered that question for us already, hasn't it? We are in the glorify God and make disciples business. Because our method is not two services in Sunday school with With coffee hour, as good and as beneficial, as much as I miss all of that, our method right now is bring a chair to the parking lot or join the live stream in your jammies. Our mission is not programming. Our mission is not even having amazing youth and kids programs. Although we invest heavily in those things and we believe they're important, they're all methods to accomplish our mission, which is to glorify God and make disciples. So then, let's, let's go deeper into this mission, and I'll do so in two parts. Let's consider the first part. This will be our next heading, and I'm calling this part Glorify God. Go back to Matthew chapter 22. If you look at verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. The first and great commandment is to glorify God, if I could say it another way. To glorify God really means to reflect His glory back to Him. This reflection of God's glory happens when we love Him with all that we are and we love others the way that we love ourselves. Or if I could say it more precisely, God glorifies Himself by calling and enabling us, His people, to glorify Him through what we do. So to glorify God is an action. It's not a vibe. It's not a state of being. We're not picking up good vibrations to glorify God. To glorify God is action. That's why it's part one of our mission. Our mission is action. We have a message, and then our mission means there's action involved. The action of glorifying God as a local assembly of His church. Now, the idea of glorifying God can seem quite nebulous. And we can say that that's our mission, but what on earth does it mean? How is it actionable? Well, let me share with you at least three primary actions, I believe, that make up 
this, this glorifying God. The first action is we glorify God by our faith. Our salvation in Christ comes by faith alone, and since faith is the root from which all of our good works flow, we would expect to find this indelible connection between faith and giving glory to God in all of our conduct. God made many promises to His people in the New Testament. Paul says Christ is their fulfillment. He is the great yes to God's promises of old. Faith, then, is action. It is assent and embrace of God's promises in Christ. We glorify God when our faith is in Christ. And frankly, I don't think it's possible to glorify God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. Second, we glorify God by our worship. This is probably where most people think when it comes to glorifying God. There's one activity that Scripture associates far more than any other, and that's worship. At its heart, worship ascribes all glory to God alone. We can glorify God in many ways, but Scripture indicates that nothing we do delights God more than calling on His name with sincere hearts, and declaring that all glory belongs to Him. Listen to our music. We're saying glory and honor belong to You, our King. All of those songs are meant to give Him honor and glory, not us. And sometimes we speak of all of life as worship. Well, all of my life is worship. And I understand that. And, and I think it's proper to honor God in everything that we do. But I believe worship, in this sense of glorifying God, is a very distinct activity when we set aside all of the other tasks and we set our minds and our hearts fully on the Lord. Of course, that goes right back to the seven-day uh, creation order and the Sabbath and setting that aside to the Lord. And this is when we receive the Word and we respond back to Him with prayer and in song, whether it's in private or in our families, but I believe especially in times of corporate worship together. In the many biblical texts about worship, the repeated teaching is to call on the Lord, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, and all the other practices that provide evidence that God takes special delight when His people are in this distinct activity of worship. So when we gather together or when we sing in settings like this, we're not doing it to, to kind of vibe ourselves up for a sermon. We're doing it to reflect God's honor and glory back to Him. That's why we sing. We don't even sing to get emotional responses from ourselves, although that certainly happens. We sing because we're honoring God and we're glorifying God by reflecting His glory back to Him. And so with imperfect hearts, faltering voices. We will do what we will do forever, and that is give glory to God in worship. I said last week that disconnecting yourself from community is actually less faithful than connecting yourself to a flawed community. I think this is one of the major reasons why. The Christian life is not a solo endeavor. It's not a solo mission. As, even as much as I would like it to be a solo mission, I know it's not. Our salvation certainly is a very personal matter, one that is between you and God alone. I can't have faith for you to believe. If I did, I would be much busier than I am. Because I would just be going around flicking people saying, boom, you have faith, you have faith, you have faith. But our sanctification, the working out of that salvation, you see in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is always done in a setting like this family here at Friendship Baptist Church. I mean, as imperfect as these human organizations are, this is where we glorify God most clearly when we're connected in spirit and worship in the Word and in our mission. So our faith glorifies God. Our worship glorifies God. And third, we glorify God when we serve others. Faith is an action of belief, isn't it? It results in worship, which is an action of the intellect and the emotion, which results in Serving others, which is a quantifiable action of, of glory. To glorify God, as you can see, is, is all outward. 
When we glorify God, it's all out. It's all moving outward from us. It's moving from the heart and mind outward into the world. It's never inward. Glorifying God is never give, 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 and consume. It's all outward. Glory never pulls in a person. Glory never rests on you. It's reflected by you. We're not reservoirs of glory. We are raging rivers overflowing their banks with glory for God. We don't glorify God when we won't share our gifting with the world. The New Testament clearly teaches us to glorify God in all of our conduct, but especially that which builds up the local body, the church. Jesus said in Matthew 5.16, Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Jesus clearly commands that the goal of our lives should be to behave so that God gets the glory. Live so that men will see your life and give your Father in heaven glory, not you. So it should be very clear that glorifying God is not just faith. It's not just gathered worship. It's a peculiar kind of living. It is faith, but it's not just faith. It is gathering for worship, but it's not just that. It is also a peculiar kind of life. In order for God to get the glory from the way we live, we must be engaged in doing good for His glory. And it's really not so much about avoiding gross sins that we glorify God, but rather the pursuit, I'll call it good deeds, or doing good works, acts of generosity, works of of, of kindness, ways of love, uh, serving others when there's no benefit to you whatsoever. That's when we truly reflect the glory of God. And since it's God's goal to be glorified in His people, and since Jesus says that this happens when His people do good deeds, we would expect that the Bible tells us that Christ's atonement, His covering for sin, means that we are free from the burden of sin and we can do these things. We are empowered for action. If you remember way back to, I think it was 2015, I know everyone remembers this, we went through the book of Acts, But the title of that whole series was Empowered for Action. I honestly don't know how I remember that. But we're empowered for action by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught us that we must do good deeds and bring glory to our Father in heaven. How do we do this? How do we serve so that God gets the glory? The answer is, in order for God to get the glory, we have to do good as one who is depending on God's strength. Not mere good deeds, but good deeds done in a spirit that comes from joyful dependence on God's help. That is what glorifies God. I think every one of us owes every single ounce of strength that we have to God. We owe every fiber of intelligence that we have to God. And the slightest resolve to do good, we owe to God. If the totality of our dependence on God would hit us with this full force. I wonder how differently we would live our lives and serve others. I think if we truly own up to the fact that we exist for God's glory, we would understand that all of our strength and moral resolve is a gift from God. I think we would have a spirit of joy and gratitude and lowliness. And in serving this way, God gets glory. That's part one of our mission, friends. We want to glorify God. The second, which will be our next heading, is is really the second part of this mission, which is to make disciples. We exist to glorify God and make disciples. Flip over to Matthew 28. If you look at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So to consider this work on disciple-making, we, need to con- we really need to con- consider our message, and we need to understand our message. So let me just give you a recap from last week. What is our message? Our message is the Gospel. It always is. Four fundamental truths that make up the Gospel. And if you remove any single one of them or add to them, you no longer have the Gospel at all. It doesn't mean that you need to communicate all of these things in every encounter with a non-Christian. It does mean that you haven't shared the Gospel unless you include these four things. 
remember from last week, it is God, man, Jesus response. That's the simplicity of the gospel. But without those things, it's not the gospel. In order to share the gospel, you must start with God. God is the creator of all things. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is perfectly holy, perfectly worthy of all of our worship, worthy of our attempts to glorify Him, and God will also punish sin. That's the first step. God made us, and we are accountable to God. The second is about man. Our problem is, is that all people are sinful by nature. By nature, all people are alienated from God. Hostile to God. Subject to the wrath of God. So God created us, we are accountable to God, but our problem is that we are separated from God due to our sin. That's the problem that the gospel cures. Separation. Jesus came to reconcile us to God. Period. All of the other benefits of the gospel are secondary to the fact that Jesus came to reconcile sinful men and women to God. And so that brings us to the third part, which is Jesus. God's solution to our sin problem. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, lives a sinless life, sinless life, dies on the cross to bear God's wrath in the place of all who would believe in Him. Rose from the grave in order to give His people eternal life. Okay. So far, so good. But we can't stop there. Because the fourth is as important as the rest, and that is response. God calls everyone everywhere to repent of their sin and trust in Christ in order to be saved. Everything that Christ has done is of no value to you if you remain outside of Him. My friends, the Gospel, I believe, is for the, I believe, is for the saved first. We need to be reminded of this Gospel because it sets us free from self-righteousness. I, li I was listening to John MacArthur this week and he said, the church has become an event to attract non-believers. That's not our goal. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth for believers. Can people get saved by coming and worshiping with us? I, I sure hope so. But I will tell you, the work of the church, remember last time, you're the church. The work of the church with the gospel happens out there. It doesn't happen in here. It happens out there. That's where the gospel does its work in the lives of those who are not in Christ. Out there, through you, the church. The command for the church is to make disciples. Who's the church? You're the church. Disciple making is not something the religious professionals do, although I do it, but I do it because that's a command of my Savior as a believer, as a member of the church. And this is what must happen. It is why we exist, all of us. You are the church. We glorify God. We make disciples. Here, disciple making is a very intentional process. And disciple making starts with evangelizing non-believers. And second, it is also establishing believers in the faith. Discipleship starts with gospel proclamation. People say, well, what about evangelism? Evangelism is a small part of discipleship. Evangelism is the beginning part of discipleship. And then discipleship establishes believers in their faith. Making disciples implies intentionality and process. Disciple-making doesn't just happen because a church exists and people show up. It's a deliberate process. The first step in disciple-making, as I said, is sharing the gospel. If you're not in Christ, I cannot make a disciple out of you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit when your mind and your heart come in contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, our message. Step one, church, our job together you are the church, is to share the gospel with those who are lost out there. How joyful it is for me or anyone on our elder team to hear from someone, hey, meet my friend Mac. I shared the gospel with them, and they want to know more about Jesus. That's so awesome to hear, because it's the church doing what the church is supposed to be doing. And it's step one in disciple making, isn't it? The second part is establishing believers in faith. And that's what most of us think about when we hear making disciples. And it's, it's establishing believers, teaching believers. 
And rightly so. I think that's a significant part of the process because discipleship is bookended by a birth and a death. It, it, it starts with spiritual birth, ends with physical death. It, it's a lifelong process. And I truly believe that every single one of us should have at least, at least two people in our lives in this thing called discipleship. Someone who is discipling you and someone that you're discipling. I'll tell you, the best place to see that begin is in our life groups. Because Jesus didn't have in mind maverick disciple makers who were disconnected from the local assembly of the church. He had in mind a community of believers who together and under the authority of the local church that he established, which we'll talk about next week, seek to transfer all of their faith to the next generation. When Jesus said, make disciples... We should also look at how he made disciples. Three years of, of teaching 12 rough men on a dusty road. You look around you, I'm like, man, the people that are in my life that I could disciple, what a bunch of clunkers. I don't want to do that. Think about the 12 men that Jesus had to disciple. Think about the people that discipled me. They had to work with what they had in front of them. The same is true of all of us. Disciple-making, then, is the Word of God shaping men and women within life-on-life -life relationships. I, I think it's demonstrated in Paul's relationship with the Thessalonian church. He said this to them. He said, being so affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. That, that's the heart of someone who wants to make disciples. John Piper, in his wonderful way of uh, his eloquence in these matters, he says, disciple-making is gospel-driven, word-saturated, intentional one-anothering. It is men and women regularly teaching one another to obey what Jesus has commanded. Sometimes discipling requires you to warn others about the choices that they're making, and that's the harder part of discipling. People grow when you teach them general truths, but they also grow when you correct particular error. And part of being a Christian is recognizing that sin deceives us, and we need other believers to help us to see things that we cannot see about ourselves. See our blind spots. That's why joining a church is like taking off your mask. New sins become visible in the course of our discipling relationships, and we allow people to see these things in our lives. In fact, you can lead in a discipling relationship by inviting others to correct you and making it easy for them to do so. The vast majority of correction in the church, I believe, should occur in the private context of discipling relationships. And it's worth, it's worth noticing that Jesus just didn't command us to teach people. He told us to teach people to obey Him. I mean, the goal of discipleship is not to make a bunch of eggheads that are useless to the world. The goal of discipleship is to teach people to obey what Jesus has commanded them to do, which is to make disciples, in part. So the goal of discipling is to see lives transformed, which means it involves more than reading a book or even the Bible with another person. Ultimately, discipling involves living out the whole Christian life before others. We communicate not merely with our words, but with our whole lives. I'm not saying the Word of God is inadequate, but I'm saying that the Word of God teaches the truth, but then we can help model that truth for other people in our lives. And that's what happens because discipling is much more than classroom teaching. It requires the kind of instruction that occurs through a coach. Now, I can, I can, I can go and hit the heavy bag on my own, but I learn much more and I get much more out of it, and my body feels it much more when I'm at the boxing club and my boxing coach is right there yelling at me to motivate and teach me. That's the difference between trying to do things on your own and do things with somebody who knows what they're doing. Helping others follow Jesus, of course, cannot be done without risk. You have to humble yourself to be discipled. You have to humble yourself to disciple. Sometimes people say to me, well, I couldn't do that because blah, 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 blah. That's, that's your pride, and it's gross. Stop. You can because Jesus empowers you. You have God, the Holy Spirit, living within you. I mean, discipling certainly involves difficult things like saying no and persevering through troubles and knowing when to bear with someone doing it. And it's also knowing when someone just isn't teachable. 
and being willing to, to tell them so and to, to stop the discipleship relationship if you have to. I've done that at least twice in my life. And to disciple someone, your invitations might be spurned, your counsel might be rejected. We disciple not just through our strength, but also through our weaknesses. Alistair Begg said that Christian discipling isn't so much the work of experts, it's the work of one beggar pointing another beggar to food. So friends, let me try to wrap this up this way. We have a distinct message as a local assembly, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a distinct mission. It's twofold, to glorify God and make disciples. In times like these, when we really don't know what the future holds, we must never forget our message or our mission. We will certainly have more times like this, but we will hold fast to the message, and we will hold fast to the mission. The methods will come and go, but Jesus, His gospel, and our work in the gospel is forever. Let's pray. Our God, we pray that You would take this message from our heads, and push it into our hearts. Lord, may we, as the church, learn to glorify You with our lives. May we learn to make disciples of those around us by sharing Your Gospel and by teaching others to obey You. Father, may we do this with the desire to glorify You. Lord, may we never lose focus of, what you, of the task that You have put before us. And we never lose focus of Your Word or Your Gospel. No matter the waves of culture, the tensions that arise, the challenges that we face, keep us steadfast for Your sake and for the glory of Christ. Amen. God bless, church. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah.